No, the title's not clickbait, and yes, Asus did in fact contact me. I can't believe it either, but it actually happened, and I learned quite a bit of valuable information, and I want to share that with you starting right now. All of this information pertains to AM5. It's not just Asus specifically, even though I got the information from Asus. I want to set the record straight on a couple of different things and, and establish a baseline. Number one, please forgive my lack of polish on this video. If you watch my content on a regular basis, you know I always edit and polish my videos to the best of my ability. However, right Right now I'm up against the clock. My family and I are getting ready to leave on vacation in less than 12 hours and I wasn't really ready to make this video but Asus contacted me. I spent over an hour on the phone with them. By the time I got off the phone it was past nine o'clock and I was like you know what this information this information is just too valuable not to share so please be patient with the lack of polish on this video. Okay first off let me make this abundantly clear. This video is not sponsored by Asus or any other company. This video is not meant to defend Asus or any other company. However, this video is meant to simply provide you the information I got from Asus in the hopes that it may help you if you are having any kind of AM5 related issues. I can't speak for Asus as a whole as a company, but what I can say is that the one representative that I spoke with was incredibly professional and extremely smart. I was very impressed with how much he knew, not just about Asus related specific products, but about DDR5 in general, about AMD in general, and how the whole AM5 architecture is supposed to work. Okay, first of all, when I say AM5, I'm not just talking about the motherboard. I'm not just talking about AMD CPUs. I really mean the entire platform because in this particular case, it really takes three brand new generations of products in order to make the platform viable. For example, you can't just take a 7800X3D and an AM5 ASUS motherboard and use DDR3 memory or DDR4 memory. You have to use DDR5 memory. And the same is true for the other components. You can't swap out the CPU for a previous generation CPU. You can't swap out the motherboard for an AM4 motherboard. I think that is incredibly important to understand because a lot of times I've noticed that when I say platform, people think I'm only talking about the motherboard or I'm only talking about the AMD CPU. That's not true at all. I, I really mean the entire platform. And now speaking of AM5 as a platform, AM5 is not AM4. I know, how revolutionary, right? It's like me telling you water's wet. Look, let me explain. How many of us have gone into AM5 with the assumption that it should work like AM4? I know I'm guilty of that. In fact, I think Jay's two cents is even guilty of that because in one of his videos, he was talking about some of the problems he was having with the AM5 platform and his 7000 series CPU. He was complaining about not being able to do this, take four sticks of RAM and use them all at the same time at their full rated speed because that's what I'm doing here. This is an Asus ROG Strix X570 e gaming motherboard. It is an AM4 platform. 5800X 3D, and I have four sticks of RAM all running at their full rated speed with zero issues. AM4 can do that, but AM5 cannot. That is not a bug. That is not a motherboard issue. That is not a DDR5 issue. That is the way for now it is supposed to work. And I can explain further. If you look at the retail websites, Best Buy, Amazon, Newegg, whatever, if you look at DDR4 kits, you can buy DDR4 RAM in one single kit with four sticks, but you cannot buy DDR5 RAM in one single kit with four sticks. They're all sold with two sticks only per kit. Why? Well, because AM5 currently cannot run DDR5 memory with four sticks at its full rated speed. If you go to AMD's website, and if you look at any of the 7000 series CPUs, you will see that AMD is telling you that DDR5 can only run up to 5200 megahertz for the 7000 series CPUs. And that's using two sticks of RAM. If you're trying to use four sticks of RAM, you can only get 3600 megahertz. And just to show you I'm not crazy, this is for the 7800X3D. This is for the 7600X. This is for the 7700X. This is the 7 900X and this is the 7950X. In fact, I even checked the non-X version of the 7000 series and it's still the exact same. Okay, look, I don't know about you, but for me, that was very eye-opening. It's right there on AMD's website for anybody to see. Anybody can go look at this. It is right there and really nobody's talking about it. It is right there on their website telling you as clear as day, if you are running four sticks of RAM, 
Don't expect anything higher than 3600 megahertz. If you're running two sticks of RAM with any of our AMD Ryzen 7000 series CPUs, whether, whether if that's X3D, X, non-X, it doesn't matter, don't expect anything above 5200 megahertz. So actually what that means is that if your system is putting out more than those speeds, you are above spec. You're killing it. That is the cherry on top. You're good, you're golden. You're doing more than what your platform is technically rated to do. The problem becomes with marketing and it's not just marketing from AMD or marketing from MSI or Asus or whatever. It's, it's actually marketing on, on the RAM itself, DDR5. Look, the average person is gonna walk into a store. Oh, hey, there's DDR5. I need DDR5 memory. Hmm, I see that is AMD Expo. Oh, okay, cool. So I know it's gonna work with my AM5 motherboard with my AMD CPU. Oh, snap. It actually goes up to 6,000 megahertz. This kit of RAM is rated to run at 6,000 megahertz. Awesome. So the assumption is I'm gonna take it home, pop it in my system, turn on AMD Expo, and I'm gonna get 6,000 megahertz, and everything's gonna be fine. I'm not gonna have any issues because that's how it's supposed to work, and that's exactly how it worked with AM4. If I walked into a store and saw a package and it said, hey, you know, 3,600 megahertz or whatever it said on it, I expected to go home, enable XMP, and get 3,600 megahertz and have zero issues. And so in this case, even though the RAM says it is rated to go at 6,000 megahertz, it doesn't necessarily mean you can get it and get it reliably, get it consistently, get it without any type of issues in your system because the CPU itself is technically not rated to run any more than 5,200 megahertz with two sticks. It is right there on AMD's official website. We've all heard the term Silicon Lottery and usually we are referring to clock speeds, right? So if a buddy and I both go into Micro Center and we both pick up a 7800X3D and maybe his is only clocking to 4950 and maybe mine's clocking to 5050 or whatever and we have the exact same settings and we have all the other exact same hardware. What's the difference? Silicon Lottery. And mo most people in the PC community kind of know that by now, but did you know Silicon Lottery also applies to the memory controller? I didn't and I'm not gonna pretend like I did because I did not. The Silicon Lottery does not just apply to the clock speeds, it also applies to the memory controller. The reason why that matters is because of RAM speed and overall system stability. So if you have a really good memory controller, maybe you won the Silicon Lottery, so to speak, then maybe you can grab a 6,000 megahertz kit, enable Expo and get the full speed and have literally zero issues with your platform. And that wouldn't necessarily be because the chip is rated to use 6,000 megahertz of RAM, it's more so because the memory controller on that specific chip that you have is able to handle it is what I'm trying to say. That's why you have conflicting reports out there. Some people are like, oh, I'm running 6,000 megahertz, totally fine. And other people are like, I, I can't really get that high. For some reason, I, I can't get above 5,200 or 5,600. That is a difference. That is a variance within the Silicon Lottery on the memory controller. So in summary, if you have two sticks of RAM, only expect to get 5,200 megahertz. And if you're above that, then consider that extra. And if you have four sticks of RAM, only expect to get 3,600 megahertz. And if you're above that, consider that extra. That is technically the official position from AMD. Now let's talk about that almighty QVL list. This is why I am so passionate about not just blanketly saying, go check the QVL because you can always trust it. Because look at the QVL from ASUS's official website. And it tells you the size of the RAM. Is it 16 gigabytes? Is it 32 gigabytes? It tells you if it's XMP or Expo or both. And in basically every case, it tells you that the supported speed is well above AMD's rated 5200 megahertz. And so that would definitely make you think, oh, this is on the QVL list, therefore I can trust it. It's telling me I can buy this RAM and I can run this RAM at 6200 or 6000 or 6400, whatever the case may be. Now, I do have a few more things to say when it comes to voltage and memory and things of that nature. But first, let me just say thank you to all my Patreon members. I appreciate the support. You guys are all incredibly awesome. And thanks to you, I'm able to start building a sponsor free future. And if you would like to be part of the Patreon team and help me build a sponsor free future and get exclusive access to behind the scenes footage that will never be here on YouTube, 
click the link in the pinned comment below. If you enable Expo, it increases the SOC voltage and it will max it out to 1.3. You can download HW Info or Hardware Info 64. And what you wanna look for specifically is SVI3 on the voltage. Uh, there's multiple different CPU voltages listed there, but you want the one that specifically says SVI3. If you don't have Expo enabled, you can see the voltage is significantly lower when compared to when you do have Expo enabled. So that is something to be mindful of. And one more thing on RAM while we're talking about it. So the Asus representative did tell me that anything above 32 gigabytes is less stable. I don't exactly know the technical reasons why. I think it has something to do with voltage, basically like everything else in the AM5 system, it seems but don't exactly quote me on that. But if you know, let me know in the comment section below. And now let's do some rapid fire, house cleaning items, quick tips, things that you need to make sure you're double checking for your system if you have an AM5 platform to make sure that you're good across the board. Number one, make sure you're updated to the latest and greatest BIOS that is not a beta. Number two, make sure that BIOS is set to its default optimized settings. Number three, make sure you take a baseline of your entire system while it's in its default settings in the BIOS. So this means power on the system, shut it down, power it back on a couple of different times. Make sure you can boot reliably. Do benchmarking, do stress tests. Test the CPU, use Cinebench, test the GPU, use Heaven, use Firemark, use anything you can to stress your system. Find some type of memory test online. Make sure your system is stable and make sure you get a baseline of where everything is. Check your baseline SOC voltage using HW Info with the SVI3 voltage readout. In addition to all of that, you need to make sure you do have a fresh installation of Windows on your system. That is incredibly important. That is officially recommended from AMD. Even the ASUS representative I spoke with specifically made sure to mention this more than once. You need to make sure your game bar is up to date. As dumb as that is, and yes, AMD, that is dumb. But you need to make sure your game bar is completely up to date with the latest version. Make sure you go to the Windows Store, check your library, check for updates. Make sure you have the latest AMD chipset. And look, I know all of that's a lot, but once you do all of that and you run your baselines, you should be totally good to go. And for most people, that's all you need. You're good, you'll be rock solid. For people who want a little bit extra because you're extra like that, after you stabilize your system and you get your baselines, now you can start tweaking a little bit in the BIOS settings. So now maybe you can go in there and enable Expo, reboot your system, make sure you're stable, run all the same tests you just ran, make sure you're still stable, check your SOC voltage, make sure you're not going above 1.3 volts. And then if all that passes, I want you to shut down your PC and do a cold test, which means you completely unplug the power from your PC, wait five to 10 seconds, plug the power back in, boot the PC back up, and rerun all the same tests. And if you pass, then you're good to go. If not, then you obviously have a problem to address. And then from there, you can start tweaking the RAM a little bit, the memory speed. You know, maybe if you're running at 6,000 megahertz on Expo by default, maybe you can lower that to 5,600 or 5,200 and see how you do. And of course, in addition to all of this, as I've already said multiple times in my previous videos, make sure you enable PBO, Precision Boost Overdrive, and make sure you are using Curve Optimizer. Now, the ASUS representative talked to me about this. He said, hey, I noticed you're running a negative 30 offset all core. He said, that's cool and you know, I'm glad it's working working for you, but that's not really optimal. You really should be running a per core offset. And the reason why I'm not is the same reason why most people aren't. It's a hassle. Like literally you have to go in and tweak each core individually and then test it and test it and test it. It's a tedious process. Okay, and now for one final tip and maybe, probably, I should have said this sooner, but like I said, forgive the lack of polish here. You can lower the SOC voltage. You can also raise it. Now you should not go above 1.3 volts. That is AMD's new recommendation if you don't wanna blow up your CPU. But in addition to that, you should be running the latest BIOS for your motherboard. And your motherboard manufacturer should make sure you cannot go above 1.3 volts. So make sure you're monitoring that. If you can't go above 1.3 volts, you can start at 1.3 and start to dial it back. And the goal here is how far can you dial back that voltage while still getting the maximum performance out of your system. That would really be the ideal goal here. And so I came up with a statement for this. The ideal perfect system will be a stable system that does not crash and is completely reliable while giving you the highest clock speed possible on your CPU, the highest RAM speeds possible at the lowest voltage possible. Again, this is completely stable under all these conditions. Now look, I know all of that was a lot, but look, you can just 
rewind the video a couple of minutes and listen to that quick fire list of things to do really quickly and then run your baselines and then once you're good, you're good and leave it alone. You don't have to do anything else. But if you want more, if you want the ideal perfect system, then you can take it a step further. Really the sky's the limit here, but the ideal goal is to make sure you're stable and your system is consistently reliable. Now, right now at default settings, I can confirm my system is stable with zero issues. I, I haven't even had the boot loop issue again, so I'm grateful for that but I do wanna push it a little bit. I wanna get all the performance I can get, right? I paid the money, I, I wanna get all the performance I can get. So I am gonna tweak it and see how far I can push it. I'll be posting all the updates in my Discord and probably some behind the scenes content on it on Patreon. So you can join the Discord for free or you can subscribe to Patreon if you want. So anyway, that's all I got for this video, man. This was a lot, I'm exhausted, I'm hot, I'm tired, I'm ready to go to bed. I hope you found value in it. If you did, please hit the like button because it goes a long way in helping me out. If you're new, get subscribed and until next time, E-Rock out.